Today, we're talking about how the performance of behavior is influenced by more than just learning and looking at Tolman's classic experiments on latent learning. Stay tuned. When psychologists measure learning, they usually measure a change in behavior. However, it's not enough to simply say any change in behavior is the result of learning. The question arises whether you could have a change in behavior without learning, or whether you could have learning without a change in behavior. Now the answer is yes to both of these questions. First, let's look at some ways that behavior might change without learning. I can think of quite a few ways. So let's say I want to train my dog to bust a move and reward him each time he successfully completes the task. Over time, he starts busting fewer and fewer moves. Now, was this change in behavior the result of learning? Probably not. Maybe he's just tired. If I ask him to shake, he'll still do that. So in this case, fatigue caused the change in behavior rather than learning. If I keep going, he might stop doing that too because he's so full of treats that he isn't hungry anymore. In that case, a change in his motivational state might cause the change in behavior, not learning. Lots of things can change behavior. If a reward requires too much effort, or there might be natural hormonal cycles that trigger changes in motivation or behavior, such as when Spock experiences the Ponfar, or the Swallows returning to Capistrano. Some changes in behavior are brought on by development. Caterpillars don't fly, but butterflies do. This isn't because caterpillars haven't learned how. Sometimes, simply the change in stimuli in the environment might trigger changes in behavior. If you turn the lights on to roly-polies, they will be more active and start to move around, presumably in search of a new dark place. A similar thing happens to people when you turn the lights on in a movie theater. None of this requires encoding of information into memory or associations between stimuli, which we typically would think of as learning. This is one reason why it's important to compare the group of individuals who have the learning or training experience to another group that gets the same stimuli but without the training experience, a control group. If both groups are equivalent in the stimuli that they experience, that eliminates or controls for that as a potential explanation of the change in behavior. Okay, so you can get a change in behavior without learning, but can you get learning without a change in behavior? One of the first to answer this question was Edward Tolman and students in his lab. He was a heavy hitter and innovator in the field of learning and one of my personal heroes. You see, he was studying learning at the pinnacle of behaviorism and he himself was a behaviorist but as a fledgling field, psychology had to form an identity of what it was and what it studied. Some people called themselves psychologists, but did not approach psychology scientifically. Instead, they relied upon divining the contents of someone's unconscious in a highly subjective way by attempting to interpret their thoughts and dreams or through what they called introspection. Behaviorism arose as a counter-movement to these approaches to ensure that psychology was being conducted as a measurable, empirical science. This meant rejecting things like thinking and the mind that are impossible to directly measure. Instead, they focused on things you can measure, such as stimuli in the environment and the behavior that results. Radical behaviorists like B.F. Skinner would propose that there wasn't a need for anything else. But Tolman realized that there had to be more going on than that. And that there had to be room for things like memories and representations, which Tolman called intervening variables. Intervening variables are things that you can't measure directly, but you can deduce indirectly by measuring behavior. One classic example is his experiments on latent learning. Tolman actually gives credit to Hugh Blodgett, which was one of his students for the original idea and the first experiments, which Tolman later replicated and extended. The basic idea is you have two groups of rats that travel through a complex tea maze, a maze with lots of blind alleys and only one true path to the exit. Once rats move through a door, it sort of closes behind them so they can't move backward. This means they're all gonna naturally find their way to the exit eventually. But one group of rats gets a nice pile of food at the end of the maze in the goal box, whereas the other group gets nothing. 
Now, as you might guess, the group getting the food tends to make their way through the maze faster than the group that gets nothing. Now, a radical behaviorist would say the food caused the first group to learn an association between their maze running behavior and the food. For the no food group, there's no reinforcement and there's no change in behavior. So there's no reason to think that they've learned anything at all so far. From this point of view, adding food now would mean they were starting from square one and would slowly learn to run faster and faster, eventually reaching the other group. Well, we're talking about it, so you've probably guessed that's not what happened. In fact, if you start placing food in the goal box for the group that had never been reinforced before, they actually started running faster than the group that was always rewarded. This surprising result suggests the animals didn't need reinforcement with food to learn about the maze, and the group that had been spending more time in the maze actually learned it better than the rewarded group. You just don't see evidence for the learning until you give the animal a reason to demonstrate it. It's learning that shows up later, that is, latent learning. This idea of latent learning highlights that you can know things without acting upon them. You can learn that you shouldn't eat Taco Bell and then ride a roller coaster without ever having to try it first. Learning can happen without reinforcement, and learning doesn't necessarily mean a change in behavior. Tolman himself was very interested in how organisms built cognitive maps or representations of their world. This allows for things like representations in the brain, something that moved away from the pure behavior and opened the door toward mental activity and cognition. Now for a bonus fact, one thing I've always wanted to do is incorporate humor into scientific papers, but it's really hard to do that without the reviewers getting kind of mouthy about it. In Tolman's classic paper on cognitive maps, he opens with a joke in the first paragraph. Tolman says, quote, most of the rat investigations which I shall report were carried out in the Berkeley laboratory. That's where he worked. But I shall also include occasionally accounts of the behavior of non-Berkeley rats who obviously have misspent their lives in out-of-state laboratories. For that joke, I salute you, sir. <laughs> if you found this video helpful, hit the like button, subscribe to get more videos on all things psychology, and until next time, keep thinking. Hey, you free this afternoon? Yeah, I'm thinking uh, to get some food and then Six Flags. Well, there's a Taco Bell right there. Why, what happened last time? Thank you.